Hi everyone. My name is Phoebe Chartok. I'm 18 years old and a senior in high school. And I'd like to share with you some of the things that I think about on the daily. Because they range from like good smelling soap to politics, to wondering if I should go blonde, to trying to remember to water my plants. I usually forget. And like most people, I'm thinking about my body, the way it looks and the way it and I are perceived. And among that myriad of different topics, that is the one that has been by far the most obsessively consistent throughout my life. And my first memory of that real fixation happened when I was just seven. And see, when I think about this, all I can think about are my seven-year-old cousins and the fact that I've been a camp counselor for kids that age who barely came up past my waist, all the while knowing that at that age, I sat worried in a bathtub about the lack of space between my thighs. And this breaks my heart, knowing that at that age, I began to build for myself the foundation of a body-hating mindset with life experience only as far as second grade. And following that, several years later, when I was about eight or nine, I was given a book. And this book, as I've discovered in recent years, serves as something of a unifying experience for many, many young preteen girls. And it is The American Girl, Care and Keeping of You. And in this book, among its delightful caricatures and graphics, I learned about periods, cup and band sizes, body odor, and toxic shock syndrome. And moving on from that particular page, slightly scarred and promising myself I would never go near a tampon in my life, I happened upon a page and learned for the first time in my life about eating disorders and about a really specific kind of dialogue I would come to encounter again and again throughout my life that I would grow to think of as the ABCs of eating disorders. It's the dialogue that tells you about anorexia, about bulimia, and that there are clinics and crisis lines available. The emotional component doesn't get discussed, nor does the fact that all eating disorders fit the descriptions firmly of those two. The book described an eating disorder as reaching an extent to which a skinny girl could look in the mirror and still see someone fat. And it really shocks me the amount of reductive language we allow to be a part of this narrative introduced at such a young age. We now know that less than 6% of people diagnosed with eating disorders have been medically diagnosed as underweight, but we've pushed to ourselves a really specific image of what someone with an eating disorder looks like. And we have to understand that statistically, that simply isn't true. And that disordered eating occurs in the widest varieties of identities and of people. But if you look up that image on the internet, you'll find that the images are dominated by and catered to women, and more specifically, dominated by thin white women. The narrative we have about eating disorders doesn't do its part to recognize or be inclusive to the entire community of people, especially considering the increased way that black and indigenous people of color, members of the LGBTQ community, and people with disabilities are impacted by disordered eating. And it was this lack of information that got reinforced for me time and time again throughout my life. And specifically an instance around seven years after I first read this book in my freshman year health class. I encountered that dialogue again and those two terms, and then they were quickly moved on from for the sake of furthering our nutrition unit, wherein I was handed a calorie counter app. And in the hands of an insecure 15 year old, trying to learn to grow into her body, that was one of the most dangerous tools I'd ever been handed. And one of the most vivid times in my life, I can recall being the most disappointed and uncomfortable in the education system my classmates and I were cycling through. And this represented a turning point for me. At the time of reading the American Girl book, I was uncomfortably conscious of my body, but my young brain hadn't yet established the connection between my body image and my ability to have a healthy relationship with food. The concepts were coexisting in my mind without a strong impact on each other. And of course, throughout growing, those pieces fused. I learned in a very real way when quarantine began last spring about the difference between hunger and appetite, the body's physical, biological need for sustenance, as opposed to the psychological desire for food. I very quickly forgot what it was like to have an appetite. And without that emotional want for food, being hungry just felt painful and weakening, which drove the cycle forward. And what really shocked me was how easy it was to fall into that place. 
During the first month of quarantine, my grandfather was dying. And I remember the morning after he had gone, trying to force myself to eat any kind of anything. But that behavior was what grew to be my habit, force feeding myself. And a lot of people told me that that was a good thing because I was keeping a pattern and establishing a rhythm. But it hurt knowing that the only way during that time period I knew how to coexist with food was by forcing it. And then there were the days that I couldn't bring myself to force it, where I forgot what it was like to enjoy taste or that it had ever been something that I craved. And I wanna add a disclaimer. I am not qualified to talk about how to have a healthy relationship with food or the concrete steps that you can take to get there. I'm not a psychologist, I don't have a medical degree, and I'm not a nutritionist or a specialist of any kind. I don't even have a high school diploma. But I do know that the only way I started to climb out of that hole I felt myself falling down was by talking about it and by letting people in and by trusting much more than it was my instinct to do so. And very, very slowly, I started to regain that control I had lost over my relationship with food. And it's something I'm still struggling with and growing through. And in the midst of the hardest months, my friend asked me how much I thought that struggle had to do with my body image. And at the time, I lacked a concrete answer. But I have realized so much in reflection about the way that catcalls and slut shaming and photoshopped images of celebrities and diet culture and calorie counter apps and simply existing in a world that will always tell you that you don't measure up and that you are not enough had led me to think obsessively about the way my body was perceived every hour of every day. And that connection between our body image and our ability to have healthy relationships with food is so real and not one that we can ignore the lasting impacts of. A couple of weeks ago, my best friend asked me if I ate lunch knowing that it was something I was having a hard time bringing myself to do. And I told him yes, and he goes, I'm proud of you. And the initial complete shame in that moment that I felt at hearing those words made me want to crawl out of my skin. And I didn't tell him how bad it made me feel having someone be proud of me for something I had accomplished years upon years when I was a child without any complication or need for encouragement for something that should have been as instinctual as seeing or as breathing. But it occurred to me a little while after that, that some people wear glasses and that some people use inhalers and some people use oxygen tanks. And then if I wanted, I could compare eating as being as instinctual as hearing or as crying or as laughing. But for every single one of those things, some of us struggle because that in its essence is exactly what it is to be human. And that is not to say that eating disorders or that damaged relationships with food should be casualized or romanticized in any sense. It is only to say that we are unified in the sense that we are struggling, that we have fallen short, that nothing is more human than failing and falling but learning to heal again, and ultimately that we are powerful bodies and that instinctual is not equated for everyone. A therapist I talked to told me that someday, after all this failing and falling and hating and crying and growing and loving that I will do in my lifetime, and that every one of you will do too, I'm going to be able to look in the mirror at my gray hair and loose skin and at the wrinkles around my eyes and be able to say, let me tell you about this amazing body. And I don't know why those words were so powerful for me to hear, but they were. So all I can do for myself is claim them now and offer them to you to claim for yourself. Let me tell you what this body can do, how far it has carried me, how many more times it's going to heal itself, how many more meals it's going to eat and enjoy. And until then, we're learning together how to have healthy relationships with food and our body image, how to advance that conversation and the dialogue and the inclusivity that we need. And the key word in that is together, People of all body shapes and types across all ages, identities, and abilities, all united solely by humanity and by beauty. So let me tell you about this amazing body, because right now, it's just grateful to be a person here existing, trying to figure it all out as well. Thank you.